The American Brain Tumor Association is pleased to welcome you back to our webinar series. Our webinar today will discuss returning to school following the treatment of a pediatric brain tumor. My name is Jillian Demas, and I'm a program manager here at the American Brain Tumor Association. I'm very pleased to introduce, introduce our speaker today, Liz Healy. Liz is a licensed clinical social worker at the, and the Nookie Land Coordinator for Gilda's Club here in Chicago. She has a BSW from Arizona State University and an MSW from University of Illinois at Chicago. Liz is also a wish grantor for the Make-A-Wish Foundation of Illinois and has had previous experience working with children and families in a group home setting and in the hospital. Thank you so much for joining us, Liz. You may now begin your presentation. Thank you very much, Jill Ann, and to the American Brain Tumor Association for inviting me to speak. I also want to thank you all for tuning in. Today we will be discussing returning to school following treatment of a pediatric brain tumor. I also want to take a moment to recognize that not all pediatric and adult brain tumors are cancerous, but since I will be drawing upon my experiences working within the oncology community, I will be focusing on specifics related to a cancer diagnosis throughout the presentation. You will learn about how children cope with cancer and specific considerations for school reentry. Some of you might recognize the woman in these pictures. They are of Gilda Radner. She was a comedian on Saturday Night Live in Second City. She unfortunately passed away from ovarian cancer at age 42, and Gilda's Club was formed in her honor for the courageous way she lived her life and the awareness she brought surrounding cancer. Her husband, Gene Wilder, helped form Gilda's Club, along with her psychotherapist, Joanna Bull, and others. You might also recognize his name. He was Willy Wonka from the original Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory. And some of you might also know what she was famous for, the Noogie. This is the name of a skit on Saturday Night Live with Bill Murray. This is where Noogie Land, our program for children and teens, along with my job title, got its name. Noogie Land is for children and teens who have cancer themselves, have cancer in the family, or have lost a loved one to cancer. At Gilda's Club Chicago, we do have kids living with cancer, but the majority of our children and teens have a friend or loved one impacted by cancer. Noogie Land is such an important component because children were very near and dear to Gilda's heart. When her cancer was first discovered, she was actually trying to conceive a child with her husband. Gilda's Club Chicago is a free cancer support community for anyone impacted by cancer. Our mission is to ensure that all people impacted by cancer are empowered by knowledge, strengthened by action, and sustained by community. Our innovative program is an essential complement to medical care. We provide a variety of free programming at our main clubhouse and satellite hospital locations. These activities include healthy lifestyle workshops, educational lectures, support and networking groups, social opportunities, and resource referrals. At Gilda's Club, we believe that social, emotional, and informational support is as essential as medical care when cancer is in the family. Some of our other core beliefs are that our members are the experts and that when cancer happens, it impacts the entire family and its social network. We do not offer medical advice and encourage people to contact their healthcare team. During this presentation, I will be drawing from my experiences I have had here at Gilda's Club Chicago. I will also be using the word child or kid interchangeably to encompass children and teens unless otherwise specified. Gilda's Club Chicago offers numerous Noogie Land activities, including our 10-week kids support and kids bereavement programs, a monthly teen time group, an annual teen essay contest, a monthly Parenting Through Cancer Networking Group, week-long summer camps, Noogie Days, which are arts and crafts that are held in partnership with the Junior League, typically held on the second and fourth Saturdays of the month, along with holiday parties and other social events throughout the year. Last but not least is our Cancer in the Classroom program. This is one way we help kids cope with cancer. Coping with a child's cancer can exhaust most adults' emotional resources. Let's talk about some concrete tips that will help a parent or teacher 
feel empowered when helping a child cope with cancer. In the next few slides, I will be covering ways to help children cope with cancer. Adults can help by telling them what is happening and answering questions simply and honestly. Common questions kids have about cancer. It's important to provide them with age-appropriate detailed answers to questions with exact language, such as the name of the cancer, location in the body, treatment plan, and how it's going to impact their lives directly. You need to allow for a range of responses and emotions. You can share with the kids some normal feelings when impacted by illness, such as anger, sadness, or guilt. Give permission and affirmation of feelings, and do not be afraid to share your own feelings, but do not use the child as a support system. Explain that any feeling is okay and normal. The first of these questions we're going to discuss is, what is cancer? It's important to share the same language the doctor will be using in an age-appropriate way since they will be hearing the same information when at the hospital. Use the word cancer and other words they're likely to hear from others. This is also something other students might ask because they don't understand. Once again, this should be shared in a simple manner. It is also helpful to share what side effects may occur so people are prepared. Many kids think everyone with cancer loses their hair. This is not true. It depends on their treatment. People receiving chemotherapy often lose their hair, so it's important to note that it's the medicine that causes people to lose their hair, not the cancer. Some parents are afraid their kids will worry more if they are told the facts about what is happening. It's important to keep in mind that parents and children have very different life experiences. This makes it unlikely that a kid will react to a problem the same way an adult would. In fact, I recently had a request for a cancer in the classroom presentation from a parent where they did not want us to use the word cancer at all during the presentation. Cancer is an impossible secret to keep. It is likely that you've already noticed that kids tend to overhear adults talking about subjects that aren't meant for them. This happens even when the kid looks busy with other things and doesn't seem to be listening. Some kids even look for ways to listen without being noticed if they think something is being cut from them. When children hear these conversations amongst adults, they often detect the anxiety and worry of their parent or other adults present. And even if they don't overhear anything, they can see that others are acting differently and usually sense that something is wrong. Kids tend to be afraid and believe the worst if they haven't been given complete information. The effort it takes to keep such secrets may rob the parent of precious energy too. If kids think their parents are being vague on purpose, or are trying to hide something from them, they may find it hard to believe that they are being told the truth. This can destroy the trust that parents have worked so hard to build. It is better that the parents learn how to share this information truthfully and in a way that allows the child to understand and take part in the discussion. Or the child may assume that whatever is happening is too terrible to talk about. This may cause the child to feel isolated or shut out from the family because no one will talk about their biggest concern. This means that the natural desire parents have to protect their kids sometimes only makes things harder for the child. Parents know that it is impossible to shield children from all the stressful parts of life and that part of their job is to teach children how to manage these challenges. In general, secrets in a family tend to close communication rather than open it, which keeps the family from working together as well as it could, especially at a time when they need to pull together. Another common question that comes up frequently is cancer contagious or can I catch cancer? It's helpful to address this myth by comparing it to something that you can catch from someone else, like the cold or the flu, both of which you can catch, but cancer you cannot. Cancer cannot be spread from one person to the next. It is still okay to do the same things you have in the past, like hug or give a high five, hang out. An even trickier question that comes up is, do people with cancer die? This question may be asked by the child who is diagnosed with cancer, a sibling, or a classmate. This question causes the most distress for families. It's a good idea to rehearse how you're going to respond to this, either with someone else or just to yourself. There are some things you should know before you decide how to answer this question. First, 
admit to yourself that this is a scary question for you as well as your family. It is a hard question for children to ask, and they may never have the courage to ask it outright. Plan a time to bring it up to them, even if they don't ask. There is usually no way to know at first if a person will die from cancer. It depends on the type of cancer, where it is in the body, and the patient's response to treatment. Even for cancers with a very poor outlook, a person's response to treatment can vary. Cancer is a chronic disease, not always a deadly one. People can live with cancer for many years, even those cancers which may over time cause death. For most people, this means they will deal with the real chance of death from the cancer sometime in the future. In the meantime, the family's focus must be on how to live with the cancer. For cancers that have already spread to other parts of the body, or as we call it, metastasized, parents will need to be direct and give children information based on each child's age and stage of development. The Fall of Freddie the Leaf and Lifetime are both great books for kids to explain and normalize the concepts of life and death. Lastly, another common question is, is it my fault? It's important that the child diagnosed knows that he or she didn't do anything wrong to get cancer. It's also important for siblings, friends, and classmates to understand that cancer cannot be caused by something you thought, said, or did to another person. Once again, tell them what is happening, answer questions simply and honestly, and give them the opportunity to discuss their feelings and fears. These are all great ways that adults can help children cope with cancer. The student may feel an assortment of emotions pertaining to their diagnosis. They might feel worried about the future, self-conscious, lonely, angry, confused, scared, or even in denial that this isn't happening to me. Children take cues about cancer from parents and other adults. How a child reacts to a cancer diagnosis often depends on how their parents or other close adults handle the crisis. Kids learn through their parents' behavior. However, every kid is different. There are different factors that may inhibit the child's coping, such as cognitive maturity, experience with emotional pain, emotional language development, surrounding feelings, they're feeling different, um, their temperament, so their personality, outlook, the way they view things in life, and cultural and religious beliefs, what their religion teaches them to believe. Other factors might influence the response to a cancer diagnosis. This can depend on their age or developmental level, they may still experience unchallenged magical thinking or possess cognitive inability to understand the potential consequences of cancer and mortality. There are also different protective and risk factors, such as a strong or weak support system, access to quality health care, also significance of change in their life, along with individual differences in coping and also the family style of coping. Last but not least, is how information is communicated to the child. It's important to encourage old routines be maintained. <clears throat> Kids should stay in touch with their friends and classmates and talk honestly about the disease. When cancer enters the family, many disruptions to daily routines can occur. There may be a loss or perceived loss of social life, normalcy, companionship, or independence. There can be changes in sleep, eating, school, and recreational activities. There may also be changes in responsibilities and feelings of fear present. So once again, all of these are great ways that adults can help children cope with cancer. Going back to school is another way to encourage old routines to be maintained. For the remainder of the presentation, I will now be focusing on back to school and, con and the considerations that go along with it. I will discuss communication with the student and family upon diagnosis, taking care of the school community, and school reentry.
As I mentioned earlier, good communication and preparation between the family, school personnel, and healthcare team is integral to a successful return to school when it is time. As a parent or guardian, you will want to inform the school about your child's diagnosis, which you can do by writing the principal a letter about their diagnosis. The school will need to know the type of cancer, treatment plan, expected reactions to treatment, and how long an absence you may foresee. You will need to keep communication open and monitor and review the student's progress throughout the school year. It is important for there to be a designated point person so communication is streamlined between all parties, so between parents, guardians, school personnel, and the healthcare team. Everyone will need to work together to ensure a smooth transition back to school or for homebound services. It's also important to respect the privacy of the family, and two main issues at the forefront of the discussion should be, one, how to refer to illness, and two, how to respond to teachers and to classmates if they would like to visit in the hospital or at home. If you are part of the school team, you should express desire to stay in touch and support the student. The student diagnosed should try to keep up with coursework as much as possible when in the hospital or at home. This may not seem important in light of everything else going on, but it should still be a priority. During the child's cancer treatment, the parent should ask the oncology team when he or she may be able to return to school. If the child is going to be absent from school for more than a few days, you can look into homebound or hospital teaching. There are education coordinators and teachers on site at children's hospitals to help, help the child keep up if a long hospital stay is needed. For shorter hospital stays, the parent or guardian may want to pick up the materials from their school and see if the hospital's teachers can spend time helping their child. Putting together the reentry plan is next, and the child's oncology team can also write a letter outlining any expected changes or medications they will need to receive while at school, or special devices they may need to use, and whom to call with questions, along with emergency contact information. You will want the school to know how to contact you immediately, should anything come up. As a parent, you should also be made aware of any childhood illnesses that may occur within the school and classroom, such as chickenpox, because it is contagious. Special accommodations for the student's return will also need to be addressed, and you may want to request a meeting to discuss an IEP, also known as an Individualized Education Plan, or a 504 plan. This is just a start. Planning, reviewing, and modifying educational plans can go on for years after treatment has finished. I will talk more about those in just a few minutes. We also want to make sure we are taking care of the school community. Hearing a student is diagnosed with cancer can generate strong feelings among students and staff. The focus should be on supporting the student's engagement socially and academically with the intention that the student will progress normally. In my experience, I have found that no one wants to be singled out. They want to be treated the same as they were before the diagnosis. There should also be staff designated to help friends and siblings cope. It's essential to address any rumors or fears surrounding a cancer diagnosis. This is a core component of our Cancer in the Classroom program at Gilda's Club. A nice opportunity for students to support their classmate is to have them come up with creative ideas. This will help empower the students knowing they came up with the ideas to help another classmate. Sometimes they just don't know how to, so setting a time to discuss and brainstorm as a group could be helpful. For example, if the child played a sport, like volleyball, the team could all sign a volleyball to give to the student. The teacher could also have a special mailbox in the room for cards or drawings for the student diagnosed. Or they could use that special mailbox as a place for students' questions or concerns surrounding the diagnosis that they would like addressed. Just as adults go to work, children go to school. This is a very important time for them and is a normal part of their life and becomes routine. It's not only a place for learning, but also for fun and for friendship. Typically, returning to school is seen as a hallmark of returning to normalcy and old routines. 
some kids with a brain tumor diagnosis may look forward to returning. However, this isn't the case for all kids. Now they are navigating a new normal. The student who is diagnosed may be anxious to return to school because they are concerned about whether their classmates will ask them about the cancer or how they will be treated in general. Either way, returning to school gives the child a clear message that they have a future to look forward to and is a sign that things are returning back to normal. Work with your child on how to answer questions in a way that feels com comfortable to them. Some may choose not to talk about cancer at school, while others may want to be ready with easy answers to common questions. For example, they could say, I'm not comfortable talking about that at school, or maybe you can ask the teacher or nurse about that. Depending on the situation, the student may want to use one of these answers and then change the subject in a friendly way to talk about something unrelated to cancer, like school or hanging out. Some may choose Every kid is unique in their coping style. You will want to figure out what works best for them and what makes them feel most comfortable before they go back to school. At one of my Cancer in the Classroom presentations last year, I was asked to come present due to the student being in a new grade with more kids. The student is typically shy, but I found when I was conducting this presentation, she appeared to open up more. She wanted to answer questions and share how the information related to her. Not all kids want to do this. But for her, it was a safe space for her to share and educate her classmates on her experience. We will want to create a safety net for the student diagnosed. Make sure they have a point person at the school the student can connect with if they are having a challenging day. Another idea is to have a signal with the teacher that will let them know they need a break due to overwhelming feelings. School reentry helps to minimize and or prevent psychosocial problems such as depression, anxiety, loneliness, fear, and behavioral problems. There may be anger or fear due to the loss of their hospital or clinic routine, or separation anxiety from the parents and or family. They may also be struggling with self-image issues. It can also enhance the student's awareness of social, academic, and physical competence. This also supports normal psychosocial development and assist in reestablishing the student's rehabilitative potential. A component of school reentry can be a cancer in the classroom presentation. This is a school-based cancer education and support program for children and adolescents with cancer or impacted by cancer. As discussed, adults and children have very different life experiences. This is an opportunity to help shape the way they view cancer. Knowing leads to understanding, and understanding leads to compassion. Cancer in the Classroom offers support for students, classrooms, and educators touched by cancer. Our goal is to foster peer support through understanding of a cancer diagnosis and its impact on families, as well as to assure a smooth reentry from treatment back into the classroom for children with a cancer diagnosis. Students will learn what cancer is and how to talk about it, address any fears regarding cancer, and learn how to support fellow students. It also helps students develop empathy and learn ways to welcome a classmate with cancer back into the classroom. These are helpful for the student because they won't have to answer as many questions from other classmates about what cancer is. The students will already be aware, as one student just told me, he didn't want to have to repeat himself to everyone. He was excited for us to come and present a Cancer in the Classroom presentation so that he didn't have to keep repeating the same answers to his classmates. These presentations are all done in an age-appropriate manner, manner and are uniquely tailored to each classroom setting. The program also enables educators to learn how students respond to illness and recognize when students need additional resources and support which helps them create a healthy transition when students re-enter after treatment. I found in the schools I've conducted a presentation that more students are impacted by cancer than the school realizes. When I begin these presentations within the classroom, I always ask if anyone in the room has been impacted by cancer. And it even surprises me every time how many students raise their hand. Typically, it's more than half. Close to three quarters of the room raises their hand. 
I think just by asking this question, it immediately connects the people in the room and shows they are not alone. Many times, teachers have come up to me afterwards and reiterated the same thing. They didn't know that that many students in their classroom were touched by cancer. I think that really drives home why this topic being discussed today is so incredibly important. Good communication and preparation are integral to a successful return to school when it is time. There are different factors to be aware of, which I will go into more detail on in the, in the following slides. These include physical and mobility changes, cognitive effects from treatment, emotional readiness, social relationships, and the types of treatment and how long. Physical changes. A student may have hair loss, changes in their weight or appearance, mobility, their strength, or physical capacity, and there may be changes in their energy level, and they may experience fatigue. All of these things may impact the way other students see them and interact with them. Another question to keep in mind is whether the student is immunocompromised. This is a state in which a person's immune system is weakened or absent due to illness. Some medicines used to treat cancer, like chemo or chemotherapy, can also attack healthy cells in the immune system, which is what is used to fight colds and flus and viruses. This means people are at a greater risk and can get really sick. When a student returns to school, he or she is at a greater risk to catch a cold or germs, and other classmates and school personnel will need to help prevent the spread of germs by remembering to wash hands with soap and warm water, sneeze in the elbow of their arm, and not their hands, and if a Kleenex isn't readily available, or they will need to use hand sanitizer. These are all ways to help a classmate living with cancer stay healthy along with keeping yourself healthy at the same time. There may also be different cognitive effects from treatment, which can have an impact on the student's learning, which can be short-term or long-term effects. Different side effects can interfere with their ability to process and the ability to catch up and keep up with school demands. The student might exhibit difficulties with classwork, tests, and homework. Different performance abil abilities can be affected, like memory. They may have difficulty understanding and remembering visual information. There may be trouble concentrating, such as paying attention or spacing out, or even trouble with problem solving, like with math equations. And there may be issues related to comprehension and processing, and they may have a difficult time keeping up with new material, reading, or writing. Since each child's diagnosis is unique, it's not possible to predict how they will be impacted. Different testing, such as physical, intellectual, and neuropsychological testing, can be conducted to evaluate these effects. They might also need to be homeschooled due to their treatment plan. In terms of emotional readiness, there may be challenges, such as coping with loss, feelings of depression, anger, anxiety, loneliness, fear, or low self-esteem. There may also be issues surrounding attention and concentration, thoughts about mortality, and even school refusal. The student may experience social issues and perceive their peer interactions to be different. First, they may need to cope with the time they have missed. They might also feel isolated, like no one understands them, how they feel, or what they are going through. And they also worry their absences have changed their social standing with friends, or they may be treated differently due to changes in appearance. They might also have to deal with teasing or bullying. It's important to make sure all students know who to go to if they are being teased or bullied, such as a trusted adult, like a teacher, a parent, or a principal. Also note that every patient is different. Everyone is unique. Different conditions, different treatment plans can have different responses by the patient to the medication, and therefore, a patient's treatment plan is very unpredictable. There's lots of research on the different types of treatment which have shown to work best with different types of cancer, and that's how doctors determine the treatment plan. It could be one of these that are listed, surgery, chemotherapy, or radiation. These are some common types of treatment. So it could be one of these, or it could even be all three of these. Treatment will also depend on the stage, type, and location of cancer, 
along with whether or not the cancer is in one spot or has spread throughout the body. These treatments also have the potential to cause short or long-term effects. The timeline for reentry should be determined with their doctor and healthcare team before these next steps. Since a person's treatment plan can be unpredictable, it also means the reentry plan can be as well. It's important to have a plan in place and then modify it as needed. You and your child have certain legal rights in the public education system. The U.S. government guarantees each school age and preschool child the right to free and appropriate education in the least restrictive environment. Schools must provide this education to all handicapped students between the ages of 3 and 21 years old. Students diagnosed with cancer are covered by these laws under the Other Health Impaired, or OHI, since they have medical problems which can affect their educational performance in an adverse way. OHI includes medical conditions which affect strength, energy, or alertness. An Individualized Educational Plan, or IEP, must be developed for each child to provide for the special education needs of the disabled or health impaired. The, in, the IEP establishes which special services the student needs and how they will be met. For children who don't meet the eligibility criteria for services under IDEA, Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act prohibits discrimination against handicapped individuals. Section 504 requires schools to make reasonable accommodations to ensure full access to educational programs for any child with cancer. In order to have their child evaluated, parents or guardians must make this request to the school administrator. The school must then respond in a specified period of time. A school psychologist will perform an assessment of the student, including psychological and academic testing and a thorough review of the child's medical, developmental, and school history. After getting all this information, then an IEP or 504 plan can be developed. If your child has had radiation to the brain, you should request testing whether or not you notice any changes. Next, the parents and the school IEP team will meet. Parents may bring a doctor, nurse, or any professional that they choose. The IEP team will review the assessment and discuss any and all findings and relevant information. By law, if the parents disagree with the assessment findings, a second opinion can be requested. Someone from the school system will be assigned to carry out and monitor each phase of the IEP. A written copy of the IEP must be given to the parents who must agree to their recommendations, either completely or partially, or it is not valid. If the IEP does not seem complete or accurate, parents can appeal the results which the school district can provide information on. An annual review of the IEP is required by law to ensure that the child's needs are being met and to plan for the coming school year. The parent has the right to call for an IEP meeting at any time if the child's needs have changed and the school program needs to be modified. The five parts of an IEP include description of the child, goals and objectives, related services, placement, and evaluating the IEP. The child's IEP or 504 plan can be modified at any time to address any changes due to the cancer or its treatment. This table highlights some of the main differences between the two plans. As you can see, the 504 plan is offered to all kids with disabilities. It offers equal access to an education. The IEP is only for children who require special education services. It must meet each child's unique needs, and it must provide educational benefits. The 504 is documented in a written plan, while the IEP contains very specific language and parts, such as goals and objectives. For the 504 plan, specific timelines do not exist. For an IEP, timelines are very specific and extremely important. There is also no requirement on who must attend the 504 plan meeting. However, for the IEP, there is a minimum number of IEP participants and who they are. The re-entry plan might include recommendations within a 504 plan that are necessary for a successful return. An IEP is necessary for modification of a workload and testing, especially if there are needs for additional services such as therapies. We at Gilda's Club Chicago do not make recommendations for either of these two. This is between the family, school, and oncology team. For more information, I would encourage you to speak with your healthcare team. I do have some links to share if you would like to email me after the presentation. 
The following slide will highlight 504 plan accommodation examples. With a 504 plan, it's important to ask that it extends throughout the school. For example, if the student is in high school, ask that it extends throughout all four years of high school. This is an extensive list, but I will touch on a few of them. Perhaps a student might need to be restricted from PE class or cannot participate in physical contact sports or has limited contact. They might even need a hall pass or elevator access. The hall pass can allow for extra time getting to classes, going to the bathroom, or going to the nurse. The elevator access can be helpful in reducing fatigue at school. They might also need extended time on classwork, quizzes, and tests, which should include state testing as well. Or even a modified workload when they have been absent for 10 or more days and the student goes on homebound. The student might need an extra set of books, one for at home and one for at school, or be allowed to wear a hat at school so that the student feels more comfortable, especially if they have lost their hair from their treatment. Sometimes some schools will offer a hat day to support their classmate diagnosed. This is also an opportunity for students to help their classmate. Perhaps they might need assistance carrying their books or backpacks while at school. Maybe the student might need permission to have water or a snack in class due to their medication making them very hungry or excessively thirsty. If the student is able to drive, you can also request a parking spot close to school. These are just a few examples and will vary for different, in different individuals. This next slide touches on IEP examples, such as tutoring for subjects in which the child has fallen behind or is having special, special difficulties handling classwork due to the illness and or treatment plan. They might also need a liaison with regular teachers to help them understand and plan for the impact of the illness or the treatment on their school performance. The student might also need teaching services provided at home or at the hospital for prolonged absences or repeated short-term absences. So how can you help? You can maintain open communication with the student and their family and be understanding and flexible. You can be on the lookout for any warning signs. You can encourage the use of the school social worker or counselor. Keep an eye out on peer interactions and address any negative behaviors immediately. Be creative and ask questions or for help. Lastly, continue to support the friends and siblings of the student. How will you know if your child or student needs extra help? It can be hard to sort out what a normal response is. Because children, especially younger ones, are often unable to talk about how they feel, they show us by their behavior. Some children will become withdrawn, while others may fight, whine, and complain. The most important thing to look for is how extreme the change is and how long it lasts. When a kid shows one or two of these symptoms, it may help to offer more support. But if the usual methods of handling these problems are not working, or if the problem goes on for more than one or two weeks, the kid may need extra help. For more serious problems, such as if the child is planning to hurt himself or herself, urgent help is needed. It may be useful to talk with the child's doctor, school counselor, or with the school social worker or counseling staff at the hospital where they are being treated. Since these experts know how other children have reacted to illness, they may be able to offer a useful way of looking at the problem. They can evaluate the child and make sure that any needed help is given. They can also suggest books, videos, and children's support groups that may help. As I mentioned earlier, at Gilda's Club, we offer Kids Support, which is a 10-week support group for children diagnosed with cancer or who have a loved one with cancer. We also offer a monthly networking group for teens called Teen Time and a monthly parenting through cancer networking group. These are all opportunities to connect with others. If you are interested in scheduling a Cancer in the Classroom presentation at your school, please don't hesitate to contact me. My information will be posted in just a moment. To sum it all up, as you can see, there are a lot of important factors to consider when your kid or student returns to school. It is important to respect the family's wishes in terms of what the best approach for school reentry is, as they are the experts on their own lives and experiences. Not everyone experiences the same things, and each child diagnosed with cancer is unique. Proactive steps, such as open communication and planning early, 
on can help ensure a smooth transition back to school. When cancer impacts a family, it is helpful to maintain normalcy wherever possible, to give direct, unambiguous information, and to encourage questions and conversation about the cancer diagnosis and treatment. To find more information regarding a brain tumor diagnosis, check out the American Brain Tumor Association's website, www.abta.org. Another great resource is the American Cancer Society's website, www.cancer.org. At Anne and Robert H. Lurie Children's Hospital of Chicago, they also have a great pamphlet about returning to school. I would also encourage you to connect with the child life specialist or social worker at the hospital. You can also reach out to the counselor or social worker at the student's school. For other resources, including books, videos, and websites, feel free to email me and I can share a resource list. I also wanted to inform you all of an upcoming educational lecture we will be hosting at our main clubhouse on Saturday, October 19th from 1.30 to 2.30 p.m. The topic is Pediatric Brain Tumors and Development and will be a free presentation conducted by Dr. Stuart Goldman from Ann and Robert H. Lurie Children's Hospital of Chicago. Here is my contact information. Thank you again for tuning in and to the American Brain Tumor Association for this opportunity. I will now turn it back over to Jillian. Thanks, Liz. That was wonderful. We now have time for um, some questions. We have a few that came in while you were talking. The first one is talking about neuropsychological testing. When do you think the best time for a neuropsychological test is? Um, that is something I would definitely refer you to discuss with your oncology team. So as treatment is starting to begin, or before treatment begins, feel free to reach out to your doctor and just address any of those concerns or questions, and also throughout the treatment process. Thank you. Um, and another one is in regard to their child has a shunt. And in your work dealing with families and speaking in schools, do you have any helpful tips on how to integrate uh, shunt in an IEP or things that this family can um, glean from your expertise of what to do with their child? Um, in terms of anything medically related, once again, I would definitely refer back to speak with the oncology healthcare team. Um, we don't dispense medical advice here at Gilda's Club Chicago. However, if it's in regards to a cancer in the classroom presentation, um, or going into the school to speak with the other students, I think it's helpful just to let other students be aware of, you know, the diagnosis, um, what the child or student has gone through, um, including those surgery procedures. So if a shunt is in place, what does that mean? Um, if there's any visible, um, vis visible um, differences in appearance, to just address that with the student. Um, when students or, you know, other children don't know what's going on or don't know what to expect, they kind of just tend to make up their own version. So it's helpful just to address any issues in an honest and open way. Thank you. Um, you know, here we do have the luxury of a Gilda's Club and you being able to go into the classroom. If someone in another area of the country didn't have a Gilda's Club, who would they approach to do the Cancer in the Classroom presentation? Right. So there are a lot of different organizations similar to Gilda's Club Chicago. Um, we are a nationwide organization and we're an affiliate of the Cancer Support Community, which is also nationwide. So those are great resources to check out. However, the best step is always to reach out to your child life specialist or your social worker at the hospital. Um, they should be aware of the services and what organizations, if not um, someone from their hospital, team, then they should be aware of other organizations that they can refer you to to conduct a cancer in the classroom presentation. Sometimes it's known as, you know, a school reentry discussion, but typically um, there's either organizations like ours that go into the classrooms or the child life specialists will go into classrooms as well. And in regards to support groups, I know you run support groups at your facility. We have a national listing of support groups. Um, do you feel that it's hard to get the students, the kids, to go to the actual support groups? 
that the parents are more likely to go? How do you encourage um, maybe a family member that has a reluctant teenager um, to go to one of these programs when we know it can be helpful? Um, what do you suggest? Um, so definitely differences between children and teens. Um, for children, it's a little bit easier um, because the parents can kind of sign them up for our classes. Our support groups for kids support um, and kids bereavement, those both run um, throughout the year, so they kind of ebb and flow. We tend to start them up as soon as we have enough kids who are interested in participating, and they're 10-week support groups. So um, it's, it's time limited, which is very helpful as well because we all know children and teens and students, they all have um, a lot going on outside of school in their personal life. Um, in regards to teens, we do that on a monthly basis here. Um, we call it teen time. And it's just an opportunity for teens to connect. And it's not in a formal setting. So we don't call it a support group. Um, it's more of a networking drop-in style group. And it's for them to decide how they want to participate. So our teens here tend to do cooking or um, painting or different art activities because um, we know that holding you know, a normal support group where people would just go around in a circle and share what's going on it isn't going to work for that population. Um, so it's just more of an opportunity to share with each other but participating in a common interest of them all. Um, we, also do, we also offer teen camps as well, which is helpful because it's for a variety of children and teens who are impacted by cancer. And it's kind of a safe setting for them to come together. They all know why they're there at camp, um, however they're impacted by cancer. Um, but it's not something that they generally have to you know, speak about and share every minute. Great. Thank you. Um, we don't have any more questions right now. If anyone else has one, we encourage you to enter it. Um, in the meantime, I would like to thank Liz. Um, she has actually updated our website, our Educating Children and Teenagers section of our website. So for those who are on this call and haven't had a chance to go to our website, which is www.abta.org, and you will find more information about um, children, childhood brain tumors, how to talk to your child, and specifically educating children and teenagers. There's a fact sheet there with some really great resources and kind of echoes some of the things that Liz has mentioned in her presentation today. And for those of you who may not have these support groups readily available, I would encourage you to join our Connections community. Um, it is good for teenagers as well since it's very anonymous. It's online. There's no need to travel to go to this type of support group. Our Connection community connects patients and family members to others who have gone through the similar journey. You can post questions. Um, you can find support. You can even do a member search to search for other parents who live in your community. And you can connect that way. Um, so I would encourage you to look for our Connections program um, on our website. And finally, if you have any other questions too, don't be afraid to call us at 800-886-2282 and speak to one of our um, patient services staff. There is one more question. Um, they're talking about getting a second opinion, and it's dressed more to ABTA. And yes, definitely. ABTA offers um, help with locating second opinions throughout the country. And again, that 800 number that I mentioned, 800-886-2282. You can call and speak to one of us here. We're licensed healthcare professionals, and we'd be more than happy to link you up with physician's name and help you understand the process about going about getting a second opinion. Okay. Looks like we're done with questions right now. Um, that's all the time we have for today. So thank you all for joining us, and thanks again to Liz of Gildas Club Chicago. Let's pause for a moment and while we conclude our webinar recording.